Dai Olopade is a Nigerian-American journalist and author. She wrote The Bright Continent. Um, she spent several years, uh, she moved to Nairobi in 2010 um, and spent a couple of years during which she, she traveled to 17 different countries across Africa, studying innovation, studying the ways that people make do and make technology happen. Um, we're really excited to have her. We think she's one of the leading thinkers in this domain. We're really looking forward to see what she has to say. Dai Olopade. Thank you. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Oh, yes you can. Let me fire up the presentation uh, and also thank very much um, the uh, CHI organizing committee to um, Allison and Joe Fish for inviting me. Uh, do I need to press the clicker? You got it, great. Um, this topic uh, of innovation for Sub-Saharan Africa is very near and dear to me, and so it's really a privilege to be able to uh, kick off a conversation with such an enormous and diverse group of people um, whose individual talents and commitments, I trust, uh, will augment some of the things I've been thinking about and reporting on for some time. So I look forward to a fruitful conversation and obviously your questions. So I will begin by pointing out the obvious, which is that getting from point A to point B in Africa is not always easy. And I mean this somewhat literally. This photo you'll see here, uh, that's me in the rearview mirror. Um, while reporting the book I wrote, The Bright Continent, I spent, as Joffish mentioned, two years traversing 17 African countries. And what really stood out to me was the means of transportation and the means of navigation. Um, I traveled by bicycle, by motorcycle, by car, by bus, by van, by boat, and on my own two feet. And I did so without addresses in most places. And so I navigated primarily by using intuition and landmarks that everyone around me understood. My apartment in Nairobi, for example, uh, was best triangulated by using a Chinese restaurant, a petrol station, and an enormous pothole. So I would tell guests that when their car would bottom out in the road that they had arrived. Now, compare this to my life in America, where I was raised. Google Maps is probably the most used app in my smartphone. Across Africa, by contrast, it was basically useless. Now, though Google had been in Africa for six years at the time and had a pretty large Nairobi office, their painstaking mapping system that we take for granted here hadn't taken African realities into account. So on Google Maps, whole areas of Nairobi were blank. What you see here is an informal settlement called Kibera, where hundreds of thousands of people live. Simply, however, because they were not uh, formally paved roads or uh, connected in a meaningful or formal way, they were invisible to Google Maps. What you're seeing here represents a blind spot as populous as Washington, D.C. Now, I should say that Google has since made some changes to their mapping interface to take seriously uh, the informal structures of Kibera. Uh, but you're going to see a lot of maps today. And, and I spend time dwelling with maps because I think maps matter. Um, maps suggest omniscience. Um, even the bird's eye view of a map uh, suggests a sense of godlike intelligence, right? You can trust this. This will get you from point A to point B. And so it's their quality to describe that makes maps so important, but also makes maps dangerous. Because what if your map is wrong? What if your compass north is compass south? Now we know, or we should know, about the pitfalls of the Mercator projection, but we rarely examine the other foundational myths, the bases for which we make big decisions. This tendency is what I call formality bias. And formality bias is a term I coined to refer to the West's strong preference for the formal sector, for legibility, for hospital corners, for ministries, and easy treaties, and long lists of development goals. 
This image launched my book. It is the winning poster for a competition to promote the recently retired Millennium Development Goals. Now, if you remember them, it was a list of 10 very ambitious ideas for improving the lot of the world. And uh, this design here is clever, graphic design, of course, but also fundamentally broke my heart. Because what you see here is the tagline, dear world leaders, we are still waiting. The very implicit logic being that the people on the bottom of the photo are waiting for the people on the top of the photo to take action. And people on the top of the photo, if you can't tell, are the leaders of the G8. You can tell because of Angela Merkel there with her pantsuit. Um, but again, it captures the bias that imports norms from wealthy countries and introduces them in wholly different contexts. It's the attention that's paid, as in this photo, to ministers and ambassadors and diplomacy and global governing bodies, as year after year, the people on the bottom of the photo dream beyond their nation states. It is a bias that is holding literally millions of ordinary people back. Six years later, I am still waiting. In April 2016, the Overseas Development Institute released a report a powerful one, I thought, on humanitarian assistance. They wrote that attempts at change have focused on improving the mechanics of response and the system already in place, rather than tackling the more fundamental assumptions, power dynamics, and incentives. Now, my book and this conversation I hope we'll have today are designed to challenge these assumptions, to understand formality bias for what it is, and to advocate for a more sophisticated understanding of Africa centered on design. Now, I've also found in the many conversations I've had since doing this work that this topic resonates beyond Africa and is relevant for anyone, as you are, thinking about improving organizational behavior, research, and product development. So let's talk a little bit more about formality bias. Um, it causes real blind spots. Um, I landed in Liberia. Um, the day that Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who you saw pictured in the previous photo, um, had won the Nobel Peace Prize, and seven days before she was re-elected president of Liberia by a wide margin. Now, throughout that entire election season and the time that I was in Liberia reporting, I was troubled that so much emphasis was being placed not on the issues, but on the fact that Liberia was voting at all. It seemed that it, it was easy to focus on the formal aspects of what was going on and not the things that mattered to people's lives. You see here this billboard that was in the capital city of Monrovia emphasizing the, the process was the most important thing rather than the outcomes. And so on paper, you had this fantastic um, moment for democracy in Africa. You had a female president. She had won a Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, she had a resume that you know, was extremely impressive. She was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. And on election day, as is increasingly the case throughout Africa, the election was free and fair. Sounds good, right? The observers left. I did too. And everyone assumed that Liberia was in good hands. So it wasn't until three years later, at the peak of the Ebola epidemic, that the outside world could finally see some of the failures of the Sirleaf administration. This is a map placing the first several weeks of the Ebola crisis that killed thousands of Liberians. It happened in the eighth year of Sir Leave's historic democratic term as president. And at a time, by the way, when all three of her sons were running ministries of the federal government. Now I bring this up not to fault Sir Leave specifically for corruption, but to highlight how too often formality bias allows leaders to pantomime progress rather than actually fighting for it. And formality bias is also very fundamentally a blindness to life as lived. So if you look closely at this map, you can see that the Ebola virus was a transnational threat being communicated along transnational vectors and human relationships. This means trade between families, uh, visits between families, trade between cities, people paying their respects at the time of death. This was a very human, um, intranational issue but the initial response, again, driven by formality bias, came at the national level, via weak governments hobbled uh, like Sirleaf's. So you can see from the map even that the capitals on the coast are far removed from the experience of people handling this issue. 
And I think not understanding this dynamic was disastrous. Nigeria, however, is a useful counterpoint. Uh, Nigeria successfully tracked a single entrant with Ebola from Liberia and 26,000 subsequent human interactions, individual points of contact, and they stopped Ebola in its tracks. Now, I'm not sure how many of you have been to Nigeria, um, but it's not a country that's well known for its public health infrastructure. So how did this happen? The success was due, actually, to Nigeria's long-running experience in trying to eradicate polio. For years, local public health workers, funded in part by the Gates Foundation, were developing the capacity to trace human contact as a strategy of eradicating polio. Now, what they did on the ground tactically was to speak directly to parents and to imams in northern Nigeria, the influential people who mattered, much more than the distant governments in faraway capital cities. So that when Ebola appeared in the country, there was already a community-based information economy. It was act easy to activate it. It was flexible, human, and responsive to a crisis, even one that it was not designed for in the first place. By the way, Ebola and polio are both officially gone uh, from Liberia and from Nigeria. So my main point is to explain and communicate that these kinds of informal systems are everywhere, and they are not going away. The World Bank estimates that 70% of economic activity is informal today, and that in 2025, 70% of economic activity will still be informal. So rather than just missing informality as disorganization or corruption, I think successful organizations and interventions learn to recognize and leverage these informal systems, which as we've seen in the case of Ebola can be incredibly powerful. So I'm now going to play a short trailer um, for a film uh, based on my book that illustrates this theme well and introduces Kanju, which is another key theme uh, of this discussion. So hopefully we've got the sound on. We do not. Should I try and plug it back in? This is focusing on Matatu drivers. No, no. Sorry, I'll play it again. Transportation in Africa is an unprecedented long-running experiment, an informal economic activity. In Mozambique, you might travel in a shapa. In Nigeria, a damfo. In Tanzania, a daladala. -dala. But Nairobi's Matatu drivers outdo them all. Their reputation is indisciplined, but very clever. Matatu drivers follow Kanju rules taking vaguely determined routes at unscheduled times and with fares subject to negotiation. But the system isn't disorganized. It's differently organized. Mobile data shows us that Matatu drivers have created a transit network from scratch that actually conforms to a logical map. Drivers have hacked the system on a massive scale, moving around more riders than Chicago, Boston, and Washington, D.C. familiar with the work of the team that specifically focused on mapping the informal transportation networks in the city of Nairobi. And that is something that, as I alluded to earlier, Google has actually formally embraced in their Google mapping system. So I think it's an exciting example of this term that I've called Kanju. And if you're looking for a precise definition, uh, there isn't one, but it's a Yoruba word that communicates the uh, specific difficulty or the creativity that comes out of African difficulty. Um, think here, the man pictured is Haile Gebre Selassie, who is from Ethiopia. Now, he was one of the greatest marathon champions in the world, but he also ran with an imperfect gait. 
not one that you would ever train a professional runner to use. And the reason that Haile Gebre Selassie had an imperfect gait was because that he learned to run with books under his arm. For most of his young life, he jogged to school. That just happened to be 11 kilometers back and forth daily at altitude. And so facing daunting odds, he ultimately found a way forward, grounded in necessity, that actually proved to be an advantage on the global scale and at the Olympics. So that is what I mean to convey when I speak about Kanju. His story and the concept show us how people conform inevitably to their environments. And in Africa, this tendency is an extraordinary source of resilience. I always say that if necessity is the mother of invention, Africa can be the mother of necessity. So Kanju is about inviting all of you to reimagine many of the disadvantages that you may have heard about in sub-Saharan Africa, whether it's bad roads or bad schools or inconstant electricity or poor governance, and see all of it as an opportunity to innovate. To see modern Africa and its diversity, it's, it's a place where product market fit is crucial, a place where public failures actually open up private opportunities, and a place where great design will actually change lives. So before we move on to some of the ideation and, and some of the concepts that I want to share more with you, I have one more point of terminology, which is that I do not like the term development or developing country. I find it very normative. Uh, it suggests that we are all moving inexorably from the Stone Age towards Las Vegas, and that that's the only way to get somewhere. Uh, so I often, instead, contrast fat and lean economies. And I use fat only semi-literally. I'm referring to the wealthy countries of the OECD, where abundance is normal, and water, electricity, and food are all overconsumed. Fat economies have grocery stores. Lean economies have markets. Like this woman, who is a vendor in the informal sector that, as I mentioned, is again 70% of economic activity in some places. So I'll share a personal anecdote with my first experience jostling between fat and lean economies. Um, my first trip to Nigeria was when I was 11 years old, and it was my first introduction to this common theme of, of traffic-based retail. Essentially, in Lagos, where I was, traffic is unbelievable. Um, it's worse than your Bay Area traffic uh, most days. But what you don't see here, and what you certainly see in Nigeria, is people seizing upon all of these stopped cars as a marketing opportunity. And so you see men and women and children bobbing in between the cars, trying to sell anything from airtime to fruit to vegetables, um, and again, transforming what could be a, an extreme disadvantage to something that allows for informal retail and livelihoods. So uh, I think what's most important to understand about lean economies is that um, there's no normative reliance on the fact that it's, uh, it doesn't suggest that the, the economy is worse off. It suggests that it operates differently, which is some of the theme that you saw in the video there. Um, so in a lean economy, broadly speaking, adaptation is the way forward. And I'll give you a few examples of what I'm saying, because I do think, again, the kinds of, um, you call it poverty porn in some cases, that you see about Africa, uh, I grew up watching Sally Struthers on TV, can cloud some people's um, ability to see the, the real opportunity for innovation. So I'll run through a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. The first is the Kenyan election violence in 2008. It was this quintessential story of failed democracy and a tribal war in Africa. After a disputed vote, 1,200 people were killed. And at the time of the attacks, televisions and radio had gone silent. There was absolutely no ability to understand what was going on. And there was no information about the chaos outside. So in the aftermath, a team of Kenyan engineers I'm sure many of you may be familiar with a few of them, uh, began to use software to map the incidents of violence and unrest. And the app they built um, allowed anyone with a mobile phone essentially to report instances of violence. 
Uh, this sped up the return to order. It sped up the uh, framework for in introducing justice in the aftermath. And it's celebrated frequently as an example of homegrown African technology. But it was actually technology that had been in the hands of the Red Cross, who had never thought to use it in this innovative way. So Kanju, I think, is about boldly addressing particular problems using frameworks that are borrowed from elsewhere in a way that sometimes doesn't occur to us in the West. What's most interesting about this example is that the innovative use of the crisis mapping software created a community that then morphed into um, something that's been, uh, been doing community-based work um, to create a space for software developers, and also created the BRCK, the BRIC, which is a rugged and portable Wi-Fi and battery extender, essentially a wireless modem tough enough to work in some of the most unconnected parts of Africa, uh, which obviously solved a real need. Because in many places, mobile connections are proliferating, but 2G is not enough to do real computing. Further, electricity is inconstant, right? In Tanzania, I think this is the highest percentage in all the African countries, 96% of people aren't wired for electricity at all. So the hardware built for fat economies isn't strong enough to resist the wind and the dust. And so um, the Ushahidi team decided to build something that was relevant and appropriate, something lean that would not need to be replaced. They funded the project on Kickstarter, and they shipped it all over the world. And the Kio kit, which you see here, um, gets shipped to a public school and allows whole classrooms of children to read and learn online. So Ushini is a great example of an African technology company, different than the California companies we admire, some of whom are sponsoring this event. Um, and the problems they're solving are local, but can go global. And I think that's very important for any design intervention, is to think about something that can be appropriate, but that can scale. And I'll remind you all, this began with a terrible election dispute. Um, which is a great example of doing more with less. The second example I'll give you um, has to do with this point I've made a couple of times about people seeing urban Africa as being disorganized. Um, as mentioned, in many places, there are no fixed addresses. Um, so consequently, a lot of goods and services that depend upon addresses are missing. So think about your phone plan. If you have no address where a phone bill can be sent, um, it's created an entire universe where most mobile telephony is now prepaid. And so it's a big problem. However, it's meant that this entire mobile telephone revolution in Africa has evolved around this kind of minutes-based um, interaction. And so the need for prepaid accounts created an economy of airtime minutes, which are indistinguishable from currency in that an airtime minute is universally acknowledged regulated in value, easily exchanged, and accepted nearly everywhere. And so in this kind of barter economy, um, backed by the local telecom and also by the UK aid agency, DFID, enabled a system for transferring actual money. So I'm talking about M-Pesa, which most people will know as um, an incredibly impactful intervention in the asset building lives of people in Kenya and is something that has created a dynamic around mobile money that has now spanned the world. And I'm happy to say, now that I'm back in the US, there are mobile payments options here. But I think it's important to note that it doesn't stop just with the fact of people transacting using real currency instead of airtime, but that it's now a platform where you can layer on additional services and value addition, like insurance and credit. And so the backdrop for all of this is the explosion of access to technology and connectivity in Africa. Some of you may be familiar with the statistics around connectivity, which is that there's upwards of 700 million mobile phone subscriptions, and everyone's leapfrogging, leapfrogging landlines to go mobile first. And now 67% of people on the continent have mobile devices. And that is a huge change from when I was growing up, where you'd have to go to an internet cafe and log in using a modem, and uh, you'd be using, you know, you'd have terrible viral software on an old desktop. Um, the mobile revolution is unbelievably impactful in terms of enabling most people to have access to knowledge. This map you're seeing here shows the undersea cables that have connected uh, African uh, cities to the World Wide Web, to fast fiber optic cable internet, only as recently as 2013. 
So the real question, and I think the source of dialogue I hope we'll have here, is figuring out how this expanding access to technology interacts with these existing, very strong traditions and behaviors tied to informality and necessity and invention. And this is where things get interesting, because it, it's really trying to figure out how this concept of kanju can inform um, lives, product development, and even the understanding of what it means to do good at all. So most people are realizing that it's not just about reaching younger people and a new generation. It's that this generation is connected and simultaneous the world over. And um, supporting this new generation to not fall further behind, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, is about trying to make sure that you do avoid the pitfalls of formality bias, make Kanju a part of product development and ideation, and try and figure out what, if anything, a lean economy uh, changes. So I'm gonna address briefly five or six areas where I see particular opportunity. I know that this crowd is uh, quite diverse in areas of interest, in geography, um, and in terms of familiarity with some of this source matter. So I think we can take time for questions afterward, of course, and it's, it's worth keeping in mind that these are not endorsements or investment advice, but you know, good ideas that I think address compelling questions in lean economies and provoke, I think, a more sustained conversation around how all of us can seek to do less, um, to, to, to do more with less. So one of the first things, I think, in terms of designing for the next billion is to be humble around not just formality bias, but all biases, even with respect to the very simplest ideas and representations. So the extraordinary story of mobile telephony in Africa is, I think, by now well known. But even some of the innovations that I've been discussing today have all happened on devices that are sometimes overlooked in the American context. And let's call it the fat economy context, because you could speak about um, parts of Europe and parts of Asia as highly sophisticated as well. And here, an experience designed for 4G LTE in Seoul, Korea, will be wretched on a 2011 degrade Android device connected to a wireless tower in Mozambique that drops one in every five connection requests. And so that, um, that's real. You know, we should sit with that because while Nokia devices, honestly, are, are, are hardly widespread in the US, in Africa, they are the lion's share of how people are accessing this information and all of the wealth of benefits that come from connectivity. Um, and if so if you are building for the iPhone only, then you are not being inclusive, um, to put a finer point on it. Um, banking is another interesting example, and we talked a little bit about mobile banking and, and how it's evolved from something that's based on airtime, but how often do we see this logo representing a bank? The Doric columns, the imposing edifice, the brick and mortar logic. Um, as we've seen, banking in many lean economies looks nothing like this. Frankly, even my bank in Brooklyn doesn't look like this. So it's worth considering what design-based graphical frameworks may be alienating. And I think what's interesting here is that, you know, even just the superficial aspects of this maybe not as responsive and as uh, inclusive and local as you might desire, but it reflects um, you know, this, this e earlier question of for whom are you building an experience? Um, and this really, for me, comes down to this question of identity. Um, in a fat economy, you could see a wearable like this. We've got an Apple Watch um, that is used for tracking fitness or competing for steps. Um, the Haile Gebra Selassie example perhaps <laughs> suggests that uh, fitness tracking is not necessarily a high area of, um, uh, it's not a big pain point for most people um, living in semi-urban or peri-urban or even rural areas in Africa. So it's the definition really of a fat economy concern. But in a lean economy, I think a wearable device, especially a very low cost one, could actually be a solution to the problem of not existing either on paper or online, and some of those maps that I, I showed earlier. Because in many contexts in African countries, the addresses and ad our identity, but the entire economy based on it is, is unreliable. So paper identification cards, passbooks, the sort of first generation, quite analog solutions to the problem of identification, um, communicate very limited amounts of information. 
Whereas smart wearables, um, again, especially low cost ones, can represent a true intervention in the challenge of informality and illegible communities. And identities, you know, at their heart create, um, yes, they create a sense of self, um, but it also, as with mobile money, can create a platform where you can layer on verticals like health records and safety, um, enhanced learning opportunities, and identity, again, is the core point of entry for all of these value additions. So um, a company called Which Three Words, which maybe some of you have heard of, is trying to do something that builds on this work around identification, but also does it in a way that's sensitive to um, informality. And so what they've done, if you're not familiar, is to um, use a landmark-based model centered around three words. So for my Nairobi apartment, the one by the Chinese restaurant near the unfortunate pothole, Chinese station pothole would be my three word address. And they have been doing exceptional work, firstly in Brazil, um, but trying to map the world along different vectors to give people identities that are more logical, either based on their location or based on landmarks that all can reference. And I think this is a very rich area of opportunity, essentially about understanding identity and asserting location in a way that accommodates informality and mixed livelihoods. And I think it will be a very key part of sustainably engaging and empowering communities in Africa um, who are otherwise waiting for their governments to put up street signs. And I think that's a wait they shouldn't have to make. So to that point around placemaking and street signs, um, urbanism is a sort of global fact. Um, we have now half the world, 51 plus percent of the population living in an urban area. And that same dynamic obtains in Africa where uh, urban migration has been defining, the defining characteristic of the last 20 years. And there are now 50 cities in Africa with more than one million people in population. So urbanization is happening, but it's happening without the infrastructure to accompany it. In some cases, being unconnected to water, to electricity, and to other public utilities is the norm. So I think for too long, the wealthy in Africa have been able to buy their way out of these public failures, notably by buying diesel generators to fill the gap left by the state's power grid. Now, Mobisol is a company that I quite admire um, that is trying to solve this energy crisis by selling 18 to 300 watt solar units installations that are financed over time. And several other companies have taken this step of creating off-grid power generation and delivering it to underserved communities. But I think the inventive step for Mobisol has been twofold. First, they include appropriate financing. A family without a lot of liquidity who's dealing with mixed livelihoods where their in income is seasonal, um, where one season they have, they're flush, another season more family members are living with them, has no ability to smooth their income and so has less ability to finance assets. And so what they've done is enable people to pay as they consume. And it's something where there's been very, very low rates of default where people have um, uh, over three years made consistent monthly on-time payments um, that has allowed them to take ownership over this thing that then adds value into their lives. The second thing Mobisol is doing that's innovative is they're building products from hair dryers to televisions that is specifically interoperable with their solar system. Um, and so that allows for thousands of household connected clients to be net promoters, um, to create small businesses around charging other people's phones and charging other people's devices. Um, and so it's been an uh, intervention that's incredibly sensitive um, to the challenges of off-grid uh, power generation. And does, I think, represent a really intriguing model um, to have a bunch of connected households that are solving this problem without the state um, and creating entirely new lines of business and services. So the next area that I think is fascinating is retail. Um, it's such a brick and mortar thing, selling things, selling goods, that um, we don't really think about it as something that can be leapfrogged. Um, the scene here that you can see from Tanzania is, is incredibly common, where someone's just selling something by the side of the road. So there, there are pockets of urban Africa where mall culture is taking over, right? Malls are places that are very sanitized and they're very orderly. Formality bias really favors a, a shopping mall. 
but there are not enough malls in Africa today to meet consumer demand, especially as you've got 300 million people in a rising consumer class. In South Africa, there are 207 malls, and 60% of trade is formal. It drops off staggeringly from there. In Kenya and Nigeria, each, respectively, has 14 malls for entire populations, where 30% of trade is formal. And in Tanzania, where this photo was taken, there are five shopping malls, and only 2 to 3% of trade is formal. So, even if you could clear the land, secure title to it, generate financing in the millions of dollars, and build a mall, you cannot do it fast enough to meet the needs of the rising consumer class. Enter e-commerce. There are a few companies, Jumia, Conga, and other ventures that are leapfrogging the brick and mortar mall um, and, and generating substantial revenue um, as a result. But they are having to do so in an environment where there's no postal service. This is an Amazon. So, these ventures have had to adapt, again, using the, the premise of Kanju to say, uh, we'll do cash on delivery. We'll, we'll buy a fleet of motorcycles and we'll hire guys to bring everything to you. And so understanding the behavior of the consumer, both in terms of the demand for goods and services and also the lack of trust built up because um, it's, an, it's a new idea of buying something online, they have actually changed what e-commerce looks like. And this, too, is a, is a really interesting area of exploration where delivery models um, fuse the formal and informal um, and is, is essentially an enormous growth category for, for Africa's uh, medium and long term. And so uh, it's, it's going to be fascinating to see how that space evolves. So the last thing, area that I think deserves real consideration in terms of all the frameworks that I've outlined and all of the talents in this room is the space of agriculture. Um, it is the number one source of employment in all of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, two out of seven households are affected directly by someone who works in the agricultural sector. Um, and it's an area where the state has been um, disinvesting systematically since the 1980s. Um, World Bank-led structural adjustment programs in the 80s and 90s essentially starved the agricultural extension schools and the places where um, knowledge about, technical knowledge about growing um, was transmitted across generations. And so um, right now, as of 2016, 80% uh, of African countries spend less than 10% of their budgets on agricultural development. So farming in Africa, which is so impactful for um, moving towards a more progressive and inclusive economy, um, needs a champion. And we've heard certainly about the opportunity that urbanization presents with respect to agriculture from a consumption perspective. Right? You have density, you have people buying things in markets, you have um, a demand source for goods that are grown elsewhere. But um, the rising middle class and the increase in supermarkets creates a kind of supply question. Right? And it's one that we're facing here. So anything that comes up with the right framework for addressing the challenges of agriculture in Africa will necessarily drive what's going on right here. Um, Africa has more arable land than anywhere else in the world, and right now not enough of it is irrigated. Um, and so irrigation pumps that are designed to be rugged, that maybe borrow from some of the logic of the rugged wireless modem that I mentioned earlier, would be an extremely impactful um, intervention in um, a part of the economy that drives economic uh, livelihoods. And generally speaking, within the sector of agriculture and farming, large-scale mega farming, the kind you see in the Central Valley in California, the kind that you see in Iowa, has been the prevailing logic. Um, it's been the formal solution and the best practice. But it would be incredible to figure out much the same way that distributed solar systems um, in urban areas in Africa have proven to work, how you can find a way to sustainably produce um, and match supply and demand around agriculture and food in these new urban environments. So that is an area of exploration I'd certainly welcome all of your uh, intelligence around. So, um, you know, my book shares a lot of different examples of uh, appropriate technology and human systems winning where governments tend to fail. And I hope that what you've taken from the conversation is not a kind of Pollyannish, um, 
a Pollyannish kind of Africa rising logic. And I think it was very important to me that the phrase Africa rising does not actually appear in the book because it's not really about being naively optimistic. It's about understanding that so many development challenges are actually design challenges. They're not financing issues. It's not about something, development is not something you can buy, right? It's something that you need to build. And understanding local context, taking very seriously traditions, behaviors, family structures, gender dynamics, um, different types of ability, different types of access to finance is the only way to very successfully support and engage um, a modern Africa that is, as I mentioned, simultaneously consuming technology and ideas um, and very much looking for, if my reporting suggests, uh, um, as my reporting suggests, looking for opportunities to engage directly. And so I hope very much that this community will uh, take seriously this idea of Kanju, um, reflect upon formality bias and other biases that may be in each of the disciplines where you work, um, and seek collectively together um, to figure out the right way to empower what will be 40% um, of humanity by the end of this century. So thank you all very much for your attention, um, and I look forward to taking questions from you. Super. Come on, let's have a seat. So I'd like to remind you all at this point, um, if you go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O, and put in the hashtag Kai2016, um, that's how we'll be taking questions. If there's questions on there you'd like us to ask Dio, then please vote them up. Um, oh, and if, <clears throat> if you really rather write it on a piece of paper, it's okay. That'll get it, that we'll get those as well. So, <laughs> that was fascinating that stuff. Was a lot. <laughs> and there is so much stuff there mm -hmm. to talk about. Um, and I have my own set of notes. Um, and then there's all these good questions that people asked as well. Um, and so we'll try and come up with some sort of balance that yeah. I think we'll talk about the stuff. One of the questions that, that's been going through my head and also seems to be showing up in the moderator is about this question of informality, right? Mm -hmm. And this tension. And, I think one of the ways to think about it is the question of whether formality and informality are necessarily opposites, right? Mm -hmm. Are those two different aspects of um, ways that interaction happen? Are they different ways that uh, 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 governments and other organizations think about data and control mm -hmm. and identity and things mm -hmm. like that? Um, for example, in the San Francisco, San Francisco Bay Area, um, we have companies like Lyft and Uber mm -hmm. um, uh, we, as in they are local, right? everyone has right. lifts and Ubers, but um, we have them locally, um, or Airbnb. Um, and Airbnb has been an interesting set of tensions between the formality mm -hmm. and the informality. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? That was yeah. not a question, no, was no, it? No, 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 I, mean, I think you're, you're, you're identifying a lot of really important threads here. One is that, you know, when I was living in Nairobi, there was no Uber uh, or Lyft, and there is now, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not that they just could show up in Nairobi, but they actually have had to adapt their business model to accept mobile money, to accept cash, because it's not a cut and paste, right? When you're cutting cloth for the whole world, you do need to understand that there are different um, nuances. But to your question about formality and informality, Airbnb is a good example. I was um, recently in Cuba, and while my area of focus and inquiry has been um, sub-Saharan Africa, I certainly think that the logic of a lean economy applies you could see it anywhere. You, talk, you could hear about Jugad in India and uh, other types of informality really being part of the cultural firmament. And in Cuba, the entire enterprise of these casa particulares, where people host you in, different, um, in your home, was ready-made for Airbnb. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, our very formal logic of I'm leasing an apartment and I've got these particular rules um, has actually made Airbnb more of a, a step change. And so a place where um, informal systems are presumed where it's, um, say, an airport. An airport's a very high-context place. You know what you're supposed to do. Everywhere you go is sort of predetermined, and there's, no, there's only one way through an airport, right? Um, whereas the transportation dynamics I was describing, where if it's, a, if it's like a very busy day on a matatu in Nairobi, they'll charge you a little extra. It's a kind of informal surge pricing. Um, and it seems to me that everyone knows this, and it's about that shared understanding about the norm that actually um, 
makes it a manageable informal system. Mm. There has to be some truth that everyone can agree to. Without it, um, that's where you start to, to need and feel like the, the bracketing of, of regulations or the state can actually be impactful. So I'm going to interrupt, and I'm going to say a very popular question. That Wait, uh, can we follow up on that? I don't want oh, to, I don't, right. I don't want okay. to just. No, I'll let you follow up. Go ahead. But because just one just of the once. things that I think is interesting is that tension, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the problems with Airbnb turns out to be not the individual who is letting out the, you know, one room in their home kind mm -hmm. of thing, but the fact that you have people who have 30 or 40 homes in mm -hmm. San Francisco mm -hmm. that they are renting through Airbnb, mm -hmm. and it seems to me it's that tension there. Um, one of the things about the Matatu that seem interesting is that they haven't been consolidated, right? There isn't one Matatu Inc. Um, right. you know, who is serving all of Kibera, right? Like, right. it is these individual things. And so there seems to me some questions there about how the scaling works. And they're engaged in a repeat game, right? Mm -hmm. They're repeat interactions that help regulate in the absence of formal regulation, right? If you, I don't know, like pocket some of the money at the end of the day, the guy who's hired your matatu is gonna never let you drive again. And so those are the things that keep people within the guardrails and those are known um, and effective, but not legible in the sort mm -hmm. of traditional way um, in terms of the bylaws of our association of matatu drivers or whatever, mm -hmm. so. Okay, now I'm really gonna ask this yeah. question, all right? so. Uh, a lot of people have been voting this question up. Um, when developing technology for developing communities, how would you recommend we avoid the pitfalls of neo-colonialism and uh, he hegemony, right? Hegemony. Right. Hegemony, okay, yes. Well, I think, um, one, it's, it's a good question and it's one that I, I, I feel sensitive to. Um, but I also think it's one that's quite easily solved, and that's the answer to sort of listen. If you look at, um, again, the infrastructure challenges drive a lot of innovation. So in many places, uh, the cell phone networks are not really reliable, right? Like, who's been in a place where they're like, ugh, T-Mobile, not working, like, and Verizon is, because your friend's got Verizon. Um, that's very common for reasons that relate to power generation and all kinds of other infrastructural challenges. Um, and so people have this habit of having multiple phone lines. Right? It would be as though I had Verizon Sprint and T-Mobile, <laughs> and I would have a SIM card for each, and I would keep them each on me in case one of the phone lines were down. And so Samsung, to its credit, observed this behavior, which is widespread, and it's, it's quite common if you're paying any attention at all, and designed a cell phone that has two SIM card slots so that you can toggle between the networks as needed, <laughs> given the state of whether it's rained that day or not. Um, and so product design, at least in that case it's a hardware example that's sensitive to behaviors, is um, really important. People, to give an example around software and kind of the same switching issue, people end up logging into your services a lot more when they're in an emerging market because they are doing this, they're sharing a device. Women tend to share devices much more than men because they don't have the decision-making ability to have their own device, and so they are logging in a lot. Is your login experience a seamless one? or is your login experience a pain in the ass? And the difference between that can really affect your success in an emerging market or a place where this is the behavior. So listening and paying attention to what's going on is actually the easiest thing to do um, to avoid some of those pitfalls. Nice. That's a very HCI answer, that's lovely. <laughs> um, I love this concept of Kanju. Um, I remember having a conversation with um, our former colleague Gary Marsden, and he was talking about, uh, who was uh, in Cape Town, and mm. he was talking about the use of um, bicycle tires mm. um, and, and the remarkable versatility of this as a sort of tool. And I forget, do you remember the word? There was a lovely word for it. Oh. No, I'm blanking on it. Mm. Right. Um, we'll, we'll ask Matt later, yeah. But okay. the, uh, one of the questions that, that, that sort of came up here is this notion of kanju and Kanju as an endemic property of underprivileged communities, mm. is that something that we see in fat economies as well, right? Can it be applied? Are there places we see that? I mean, there's a lot of sort of academic literature that looks at this concept of grit, and grit as like a, an ingredient for success, that the, the productive friction in needing to run to school with a books under your arm every day for, for kilometers and kilometers, um, that may be replicated in just not necessarily having access to everything. Um, I think in a fat economy, it's harder to make that argument at a societal level. Um, there's this concept of bounty and spread. Bounty meaning we have the ability for everyone to get a DVD player, 
right? Like that's something that's widely accessible that even King George didn't have, right? But then there's the concept of spread, which is the distribution of this, these goods and services. And that's where you know, societies are incredibly unequal. And I would say um, the point I made about privileged people in emerging markets buying their way out of the public sector is a big problem. I would say it's something of an issue here as well. So there are certainly parallels. Um, but I do think that you know, some things are very easy here. And there's some things that I take for granted. And having been someone who's been in the diaspora, who's spent a lot of time in Africa, but a lot of time here, um, even just like how long I'm showering is the kind of thing that you, you just forget. It's, it's, you know, people are doing things backwards and in heels with one hand tied behind their back. And so it's really a miracle that anything happens at all. Mm. Mm, okay. All right, we've got time for, I think, one more question. Oh, one more Do you want to do that one or do you want to? make up your own. You have the privilege of, you know. I have the privilege. I, I'm, I'm all about the participatory nature of this experience um, for obvious reasons. So I am um, I'm going to ask uh, one of the top questions here. Um, I see risk, okay, this is from Miriam who identified herself, not an anonymous one. Um, I see risk in Kanju. When you innovate to cope with your local problems, can you stop fighting against the origin of the problem? What do you think? Hmm. I mean, that's a very important conversation to have. I think my approach to it is grounded in like a fundamental sense of impatience. Mm. I think when you um, presume, again, in the logic of the sort of form formality bias, um, that the person or institution's best position to solve a problem are the state, you will be disappointed in Africa every day. Um, <laughs> as has been the case for years. And so, when you look at that statistic, like 96% of Tanzanians are not wired for electricity at home, you wonder, is the right intervention to like build a grid out to the most far-flung rural areas, or are we going to leapfrog and figure out this home solar installations that like also could be like wireless mesh networks in certain pockets, um, figuring out ways to do service delivery in the absence of state function is actually perhaps more generative in certain cases, and I think it is a shame that something like uh, sanitation infrastructure uh, isn't the province of a government, but um, I shouldn't say that it's not improving because governance in Africa has been the um, sort of success story of the last 15 years, but that it's happening too slowly um, and that even outside of um, the kinds of public goods we're talking about, like infrastructure around whatever, electricity and water, even you look at the finance system, right? How many good ideas die on a vine in Africa every day for lack of access to finance? You know, in Kenya, it's a country of 40 million people. There are only 22,000 mortgages, right? And so there is room for financial services to, inve to, to invest um, in, in serving these particular kinds of markets and serving particular kinds of borrowers who are gonna pay every day for three years for a solar installation on time but are not being served by the traditional banks. Mm -hmm. So um, beyond the sort of government sector failures, there are also other massive uh, market failures that are really, really wide open for um, smart businesses and organizations to just get in there and crack. And we haven't even talked about health. So we there's do. a lot to do. Excellent. Um, that's what we've got time for. I want to remind everybody that in half an hour, we're now going to have a nice long coffee break. Um, but in half an hour, you can come back to this room and watch the video showcase, the best of the videos that have been submitted um, to Kai. Um, but before we do that, go and have a coffee, and please join me in thanking Dio very much for coming. Thank you.